Hi, everybody. This is going to be a little uh, groundwater hydrology crash course. Uh, the purpose of this crash course is to give you an idea of how uh, groundwater works so that you can have that perspective for working on your uh, project for the class. Um, so I'm going to jump right in. The first thing I want to do is talk about aquifers and just kind of very generally how groundwater moves and flows in a natural system. So I'm going to draw some pictures and we're going to talk about what's in these pictures. So this is a hillside. So this represents a cross-section, a cross-sectional view of a hillside. The groundwater underneath the hillside is going to follow a similar uh, shape. So the water table is generally an attenuated version of what your uh, surface topography looks like. So the groundwater table is often signified using a symbol that looks like this, a little triangle with a couple of lines under it. Now, uh, let's define a few terms here. So first, we're going to talk about the surface. That's here. The surface topography is typically what we'll refer to. Topogra. There we go. Surface topography. This is your, your slopes, your uh, surface features. It's everything that's on the ground. Next is the water table. Water table is often uh, misunderstood. So often people re will refer to all of the water that you can find underground as the water table. Uh, in groundwater hydrology, the true definition of the water table is the top of all the saturated water underneath the ground. So the water table separates two zones you have the unsaturated zone or the Vados zone. Sorry. Unsaturated or the Vados zone. What you'll find in hydrology and many other fields as well is that everything has more than one name because it would be too easy if everything had just one name. So it's the unsaturated zone or the Vado zone. The water table separates that zone from the saturated zone. In the saturated zone, all of the available empty space is filled with water. In the unsaturated zone, there may be some water in the empty spaces but primarily it's going to be air. So all the, what I refer to as the empty spaces, that's the pore spaces. But so the water table itself is the uh, place where the unsaturated zone ends and the saturated zone begins. Now the reality of that situation is it's not just a, a sharp line. It, there's a, a zone right along the edge called the capillary fringe which is pretty wet and mostly saturated, it's sort of a fade from dry to, to completely saturated. That's called the capillary fringe. For the purposes of this class, don't worry about the capillary fringe. Okay. Now this is your standard, uh, view of what's called an unconfined aquifer. In an unconfined aquifer, uh, the water in the aquifer or in the saturated zone of the aquifer is, uh, there's nothing blocking access to that water from the surface. What I mean by that is when it rains on this surface, 
that rainwater, it is possible for that rainwater to infiltrate the surface, reach the water table, and recharge the aquifer. So there's an unconfined aquifer. There's also what's called a confined aquifer. So let's draw another picture. In a confined aquifer, here's our hillside again. In a confined aquifer, you may have some kind of impermeable layer And underneath that impermeable layer, you'll then find saturated groundwater. This impermeable layer is called either an aquitard sorry my spelling's getting pretty bad or an aquaclude an aquitard very little water can pass through an aquitard an aquaclude no water can pass through it in nature, there's not really any such thing as an aquaclude. Everything that would be considered an aquaclude is probably more of an aquitard. You'll sometimes hear the terms used interchangeably. I usually try to always call it an aquitard because that's more likely what it is. Now, in a confined aquifer, which is what we're talking about here, the groundwater in that confined aquifer is held in place there by an aquitard, some impermeable layer. So rainfall on the surface may percolate into the subsurface, but it will not reach the confined aquifer because it can't get through this confining layer, which is another name for it. Impermeable layer, aquitard, aquaclude, confining layer. This confining layer is typically going to be typically going to be made up of perhaps a clay or bedrock or some kind of material that water can't get through. Most commonly in uh, softer soils, most commonly that's a clay. Add that to my picture there. So these are the two primary aquifer types. An unconfined aquifer, where access to the water from the surface is direct, versus an unconfined aquifer, I'm sorry, an unconfined aquifer where the access is direct versus a confined aquifer where uh, there is no communication between the surface and the aquifer. Now in a typical uh, location anywhere where you have significant groundwater, when you have a confined aquifer, usually there's also an unconfined aquifer above it. So you're not gonna have just a confined aquifer and no unconfined aquifer under most circumstances. So you'll usually see both of these in the same cross section. But for the purposes of our discussion, it's best to talk about them separately. Okay. So let's concentrate on the unconfined aquifer for a minute here. So we'll go back up to unconfined. I'm gonna draw a new aquifer. And we're gonna talk a little bit about measurements we might take in this aquifer. So here's a new hillside. Here's the water table. One more. Okay, so I mentioned at the beginning that the shape of the water table is gonna be sort of an attenuated version of the surface topography. And what I mean by that is if you have a hill slope like we have here, we have a hill slope like this, the aquifer is also going to have a shape that takes it downhill. Now in a flowing aquifer, and all aquifers are flowing water, the water is not 
still. It's actually moving. It's always going to flow from areas of, basically it's going to flow downhill. It's going to flow from high to low. So it's going to flow in this direction. When the water table intersects the surface, it then starts feeding into surface water. So if you're next to a stream or a lake or a pond and you want to know where the water table is, you can walk over to the edge of the stream and right where that, right where that surface body of water ends, that's the water table. So that's an intersection of the water table with the surface. The shape of that intersection we can talk about offline. That's not really terribly important for this discussion. In fact, we're not really going to worry too much about surface water in general. We're going to be mostly concerned with our groundwater. Okay, so the water table represents the top of the aquifer. Okay, so if you wanted to measure the location of the water table, the way you would do that is by installing what are called piezometers. So a piezometer, sometimes it's just called a monitoring well. All it is is a tube that goes from the surface through the subsurface and into the aquifer. When you install a piezometer, spelled like this, piezometer. When you install a piezometer into an unconfined aquifer, the water level in that piezometer will rise to the water table. So if you have a piezometer that is in a confined in an unconfined aquifer, you can measure where that uh, water level is located. The way you would take that measurement typically is uh, you would use a tape measure device that you would measure from the top because you can stand up here on the surface and drop your tape down into the, so you can drop your tape down into the piezometer and measure where the water level is. Uh, there's an instrument to do that that has a little electrode on it. And when the electrode touches the water, it completes a circuit. And there's usually a little speaker built into the, the tape. So the electrode's at the end of the tape, which is also the wire. And there's a speaker on the reel that beeps when it touches the water. So you can use that to find where the water table is, or where the water level in the piezometer is, and measure the distance from the top of the water to the top of the piezometer casing. Typically when piezometers are installed, uh, a surveyor comes out after everything's installed, all the cement's dry and everything, and the surveyor will uh, measure the elevation of the top of the piezometer. Typically these piezometers are made of PVC pipe. Uh, a standard size for a piezometer is a two inch diameter PVC pipe. On the top of the PVC where it's sticking out of the ground, so have your PVC pipe sticking out of the ground here, what the surveyor will do is they'll carve a little notch into the PVC pipe. All right, let's draw my notch, a little better notch. And that's the point where their survey has measured the elevation of the top of the piezometer. So when you measure the depth to the water in the piezometer, you measure it from the notch. So you hold your tape next to the notch. Then you can measure the distance from the top of the water column in the piezometer to the surveyed notch. And that way, you can then subtract that distance from the elevation of the surveyed notch. And then you have the elevation of the groundwater in that piezometer. Now, in an unconfined aquifer, like I just mentioned, the water level rises to the water table. So therefore, when you make that measurement, you now have a measurement of the elevation 
of the top of the water table, or the elevation of the water table, I should say. So any piezometer, you can find the elevation of the water table. Not directly the elevation of the water table, but what you measure is the depth to water from the top of the casing, which has a known elevation. So you can then calculate the elevation of the water table. Okay, so that's how piezometers would work in an unconfined aquifer. So let's move on to a confined aquifer. So we have our hill slope, we have our confining layer. And under our confining layer, we have our saturated groundwater in the unconfined aquifer. Okay, now if you put a piezometer into a confined aquifer, so instead of drilling into the confined aquifer, unconfined aquifer, we drill our piezometer down through the confining layer and into the confined aquifer. Now, in the confined aquifer, things work a little bit differently than the unconfined aquifer. Let's, before we continue our discussion of piezometers in the confined aquifer, let's go back to our unconfined aquifer. And I'll talk a little bit about what happens when you have more or less water in your unconfined aquifer. So if, you're, if you have a big rainstorm and you get a lot more water in your unconfined aquifer, what ends up happening is the water table rises. So you get a higher water table. With your higher water table, you're gonna have a higher level of water in your piezometers because they measure the water rises to the top of the water table. So you have a high, high water table, higher level in your piezometers. Let's say we have a very dry summer. In that case, the water table gets lower. When the water table gets lower, that's not a very good picture. Water table gets lower, the water level in the piezometer is going to drop to the lower water table. But you still have the ability to measure where the water table is using that piezometer. Now, in a confined aquifer, the location of the top of the water right here. So this is the, the top of the water. That does not change ever. It's a confined aquifer. All the amount of water that's in this aquifer isn't going to change. It's not going to go up. It's not going to go down. What is going to change is the pressure of that water. So let's see. I'm going to try to make some room with this picture here a little bit. Perfect. So with a confined aquifer, typically, if you look at a long distance away from your confined aquifer, eventually this confining layer is going to maybe peter out. So maybe your confining layer goes away. And eventually, at some point, this confined aquifer is an unconfined aquifer, you know, way up the hill somewhere, where rainfall can get into the aquifer. So all this water in the aquifer is recharged somewhere. It's just not recharged anywhere near where you're looking at it. So the weight of the water actually pushing on this confined aquifer is what's going to pressurize the aquifer. So with our unconfined aquifer, the actual amount of water determines where the water table is. But with the confined aquifer, the location of the water never changes. It's always in the same place. What changes is the pressure. So if you place a piezometer into a confined aquifer, the water level is going to rise not just to the top of where the water is, but it's going to rise to a level associated with the pressure of that water in the confined aquifer. <clears throat> 
Now, we can connect. If you have a bunch of piezometers, you can uh, come up with a picture of what your, what your water table looks like. So in your confined aqu unconfined aquifer, if you have a bunch of piezometers, you can uh, develop a surface that shows what your water table is going to look like. You can do a similar thing with a confined aquifer. So you can connect the dots in your piezometers in your confined aquifer, and that's going to create what's called a, again, it's going to have more than one name. It's called a potentiometric surface. Potentiometric or a piezometric surface. So two names for the same thing. And this piezometric surface or potentiometric surface is kind of like a virtual water table. So for those of you who are, um, you know, who talk to hydrologists, if you call it a virtual water table in front of a hydrologist, they're gonna laugh. But I like to call it that just as sort of a analogy to give you an idea of what this potentiometric surface is. So what it is, is basically, it's where the water table would be if this aquifer were not a confined aquifer. So if this confined aquifer were actually unconfined, your potentiometric surface is where the water table would be. And when you put a piezometer into a confined aquifer, the water level in the piezometers is gonna rise to that potentiometric surface or to where the water table would be if it were not a confined aquifer. Okay, so that brings us to the next topic here. So that's kind of a quick overview of the two kinds of aquifers and things that you might measure in them. We'll come back and talk a little more about the two kinds of aquifers in a little while when we start talking about wells. But before we do that, before we get to wells, I wanna talk about what you're actually measuring in a piezometer. Okay, so I mentioned that in the piezometer, you're able to measure the location of the water table in a confined, unconfined aquifer or the location of the piezometric surface in a confined aquifer. But the quantity that you're actually getting a measurement of is called hydraulic head. Hydraulic head has three components to it. The first component is elevation, Z. The second component is pressure head. third component is velocity head. Velocity head is a momentum term and it is imparted by the uh, kinetic energy of a moving fluid in terms of hydraulic head. In groundwater, groundwater moves very very slowly. It moves but it moves very slowly. It moves on the, it's typically measured on the order of centimeters per day. So it's a very slow moving process. What that means is the velocity head, oops. That means the velocity head is generally considered negligible or zero. So it usually gets left out of the equation. So in that case, our total head is gonna be elevation plus pressure head. So pressure head is, uh, comes from, calculation for pressure. So pressure is equal to uh, rho, the density of the fluid, uh, times gravity, times the height of the fluid column, rho gh. The pressure head we're interested in turns out to be this h here. So uh, pressure head, so if we can, you know, 
rearrange this, we have H equals the pressure divided by rho G, and that's gonna be our pressure head. So total hydraulic head in terms of groundwater, H is equal to the elevation plus the pressure head. So when you measure these things in a water column, here's what happens. So let's say we have a water column here. We have a water column and a well. So here's our water table. And this is full of water. So at the top here, if we're taking a measurement at this location right here, the elevation is gonna be, well, let's say it's 50 meters. Now typically th this is gonna be the elevation with respect to some kind of datum. Usually the datum is mean sea level. So in this case, we're talking 50 meters above sea level. Okay. Now let's say the bottom of the well here is at sea level. So the elevation Z is equal to zero meters at this location. Okay, now at each of these locations, we can also measure the pressure head. So the pressure at these locations is gonna be equal to the density of the fluid, which is water, multiplied by G, the acceleration due to gravity, multiplied by H, the height of the water above the measurement point. Now we're just interested in head, so we divide the pressure by uh, rho g, and that just gives us h, which is the height of the water column above our location. So here at the top, our pressure head, or our height of water above our measurement point is zero. There's no water above the top here. At the bottom here, we have 50 meters of water sitting on top of this measurement point. So that means we have 50 meters of pressure head above that. Now, at any given location, the total head is equal to the elevation plus the pressure head. So here at the bottom, our total head is equal to 50 meters. So we have Z is zero, pressure head is 50. At this location at the top here, our total H is equal to 50 meters. Our pressure head is zero, but our elevation is 50. So the total head at both of those locations is the same. It's 50 meters. So there's an assumption that's used in groundwater hydrology often. It's called the Dupuy assumption. The Dupuy assumption states that the total hydraulic head anywhere in the water column is gonna be the same. So if we take a measurement here, let's say Z at that location is 25 meters. Well, also at that location, we have pressure head, we have another 25 meters of water column on top. So the total hydraulic head is 50 meters. The Dupuy assumption Total H is the same anywhere in the water column. So this becomes very useful when you're actually trying to take measurements of total head. So Ways you can measure total head, there's a few ways to do it. I already mentioned dropping a tape down the piezometer and measuring the depth to water from the top. When you do that, what you're measuring is the elevation at the top of the water. That's the total head at the top of the water table, at the water table, I should say. So by measuring that, you get Z equals 50, pressure head equals zero, total head equals 50. If you were to measure somewhere down here in the middle here, you would be able to measure that Z is 25. Then you'd also have to account for the height of the water column above it, which would be another 25. So using a tape to measure that is a little more difficult. But what you can do is you can put a device in the well called a pressure transducer. 
And a pressure transducer, you can put that in the bottom of the well, and instead of measuring the depth from the top of the well to the top of the water, it measures the weight of the water sitting on top of the bottom of the well. So as long as you know how deep the bottom of the well is, and you know what weight of water is sitting on top of that pressure transducer, you can then find that the pressure head at the bottom is 50. So you can use either a pressure transducer measuring weight at the bottom, weight of water at the bottom, the pressure of water at the bottom, or you can use a tape measuring the elevation of the top. Or you can have some kind of hybrid measurement anywhere in between that's gonna give you a measurement from which you can derive total H. But anywhere that you measure, the total H is gonna be the same. That's what Dupuis assumption says. This makes our lives a lot easier when we wanna take measurements. And the Dupuis assumption holds inside of a well because a well, the only thing that's in there is water and air. Dupuis assumption doesn't necessarily hold everywhere in, uh, in an aquifer for reasons that we'll discuss a little bit later. But so what you're measuring in your well is total head, H. Okay, so we've talked about wells that are drilled into aquifers to observe the uh, condition of the aquifer, how much water is in there, things like that. Those are the piezometers. Um, but let's talk now about wells that are used to extract water from these aquifers. So we're gonna go back to our confined aquifer here, or unconfined aquifer here, I'm sorry. I'm gonna redraw it. So another picture of the aquifer. Here's our hillside. Here's our water table. So let's say we install a well down in the low part here at our confined aquifer. And we want to pump water out of this well. So we throw a pump in there, we turn it on, we start pulling water out. So you can use that to you know, water the grass or take a shower or both. When you start pumping water out of the aquifer, the total, the amount of water that's there starts reducing. So what happens is the water table around the pumping well starts to form what's called a cone of depression. And a cone of depression, not a psychological term, a cone of depression eventually reshapes the water table so that it looks a little more like this. Oops, I kind of drew over or erase some of my water table picture here. So now our water table shape is gonna look more like this. And what that does is it actually pulls the water table down, not just at the well, but all the way around it too. So let's put some labels on here. Pumping well, unconfined aquifer. Okay. So let's say you install a second well, maybe further uphill here. And it's gonna start pumping water out too. So that's gonna create a second cone of depression here. It's gonna start pulling our water table down. When it intersects the other cone of depression, you start having an additive effect in your two cones of depression. So eventually, you're gonna end up with something like this. So now you get two cones of depression and possibly the second cone of depression is gonna interfere with the first one and maybe make the water in that well drop down sooner 
And that's the problem that we're trying to solve in our project is a two well problem like this. Now this is for an unconfined aquifer. The one we're working on in our project is actually gonna be for a confined aquifer. So I'll show you how that would work. But it's very similar. So for our confined aquifer, we have our hillside, we have our confining layer. We have our confined aquifer. So we install a piezometer in the lower part of our confined aquifer here. And it starts pumping. So what we need to actually be concerned with here is our piezometric surface. Now, once we start pumping out of this well here, we're gonna create a cone of depression, but not in the water itself. So the actual aquifer is gonna stay the same. We're not gonna be changing how much water is there. What we're gonna do is we're going to be pulling down our piezometric surface and creating a cone of depression in our piezometric surface. And by doing so, the water level in our well is gonna drop as well. So our piezometric surface in our confined aquifer changes. So it's just like it's just like what happened to the water table in the unconfined aquifer, but in this case, it's our sort of quote unquote virtual water table that's changing. Now, if we install a second well uphill into the confined aquifer, then it's gonna change the nature of our piezometric surface as well. And it will possibly, nay, probably interfere with the cone of depression of the other well. So in both cases, the confined aquifer and the unconfined aquifer, we are creating cones of depression. The cone of depression is a physical cone of depression in the water table for the unconfined aquifer. For the confined aquifer, it's in our piezometric surface or virtual water table. So that's the problem that we're gonna be trying to solve in the project. Okay, so let's move into a more quantitative approach to all this. So how do we measure these things? So I'm gonna describe for you an experiment completed by a uh, French physicist named Henri Darcy. Let's see if I can spell his name correctly. So Darcy's experiment, he took a tube at a particular incline and filled that tube with sand. And then he saturated that sand with water and measured how fast the water moved through the tube. Um, the way he did that was by collecting water at the bottom in a bucket and figuring out, so this is not a very good picture of a bucket, but he collected water in a bucket at the bottom and measured how fast the bucket filled up. So he could measure a volumetric flow rate through this tube full of sand. They tried different types of sand in there and found that different types of sand uh, changed how fast the water flowed through the tube. Also found that different angles of incline changed how fast water flowed through the tube. The general idea behind this was he came up with an equation that uh, describes the flow of water through a porous media. So water flow through a porous media is described using Darcy's law. Darcy's law looks like this. 
um, I'll write it out first in a volumetric form, then we'll convert it to a uh, velocity type of form, which is the form we'll want to use for our project. So the volumetric form of Darcy's law, Q, the volumetric flow rate, is equal to um, a constant multiplied by the cross-sectional area of the, uh, well, in the case of Darcy's experiment, the tube, but it could be the cross-sectional area of any type of uh, measurement multiplied by the gradient of H, the hydraulic head. So the gradient of H is going to be uh, the hydraulic head here, H1, hydraulic head here, H2, the difference between those divided by the distance between them, L. So gradient of H, in its simplest form, the gradient of H equals H2 minus H1 divided by the distance between them. So it's a slope, rise over run, in the simplest form. Okay, so that's gradient of H. K, or in this case, negative K, is called the hydraulic conductivity. Hydraulic conductivity is a quantity that um, controls the speed that water can flow through a particular media. It's a property of uh, both the fluid, water, and of the substrate. In this case, a sand or some kind of uh, porous media. Uh, part of hydraulic conductivity is the permeability. So permeability is a property of the substrate itself. Uh, when the fluid is water, we usually talk in terms of hydraulic conductivity. Um, when you start dealing with things like oil and other types of, well, typically oil, uh, but uh, any other type of fluid that might be flowing through a porous media, then we start talking permeability instead of hydraulic conductivity. But hydraulic conductivity is sort of special for water. The negative sign is just there to demonstrate that the um, water is going to flow from high hydraulic head to low hydraulic head. Okay, so we can convert this. This is a volumetric flow rate. We can convert this by dividing both sides by the cross-sectional area. That gives us what's called the Darcy velocity. Lowercase q is equal to negative k times the gradient of h. And this is Darcy's law as we're going to approach it for our project here. Q equals negative K grad H. 